The thing with most present day design in Western culture is everything has one purpose and that's it. And it's really sad because we can find opportunities to um, integrate other functions into our spaces to serve multiple needs. And, and it's crazy, I went through engineering, I spent six years learning mechanical engineering and we, we got two courses in design in that entire six years. The rest of it was mathematics, which I'm grateful for, but um, I literally took a permaculture design course, 72 hours, it completely rewrote my engineering degree. And they literally could have spent 25 minutes talking about something called needs and yields, which is a, a design methodology that we use in permaculture, and it would have changed the entire engineering degree. And that's why I teach that program, is because what I've discovered is that every human is intrinsically uh, or, or genetically programmed to design. We all have it in us to design. And all we need are a few tools and a bit of inspiration, and the design act will, will magically emerge. And, and what I've found, I cannot believe the type of designs that people produce when they just get given a couple of small tools. And so needs and yields are essentially uh, a mechanism that we use in permaculture to try and understand the intrinsic characteristics of every element, whether it's a chicken, a greenhouse, a house, a septic field. And we look at the needs of a system, and we look at the yields of a system, and then we try and look at all the needs and yields of a system, and then we try and find out where those relationships can co coexist and, and support each other. And we get those right, we create designs that sing that are effortless. And this is the piece that I think is missing in our culture right now. You all have, if you're at a talk like this today, you have all felt this sentiment that I'm going to put into your mind right now, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna verbalize for you, but you probably never put words to it. It's on Facebook, it's in our newspapers, it's um, in our conversations, and the words that you have felt but never have verbalized is that humans are inherently destructive, okay? It's like, I see a lot of shaking heads there. The thing is, is that humans are not inherently destructive. We can be just as positive as we are negative. The most negative thing is the nuclear bomb. What's the most positive? We don't actually know. The reason that we feel so negative is all we see around us is destruction. The reason we see destruction is because we're not creating enough integration in our design. We're not understanding how systems can speak to each other and how we can create closed loop, loop type feedback mechanisms. And so we do that through the lens of these greenhouses, but we can do in everything that we put onto our properties. So our greenhouse becomes a food forest, a Mediterranean food forest, an annual garden. We've got a wood-fired hot tub, so now we've got a combination of gray water that we can use to, to irrigate our crops. We can also soak our lazy bones in it. And so now we're not just heating up water, we're also heating up thermal mass. We're also creating an irrigation mechanism for the greenhouse. Um, I, anybody here pressure can? It's the most annoying thing in the world. It's wonderful to see the products, but we're pressure canning right now um, some of our stuff in the freezer that we didn't get through over the winter. And it's just like, I come home and it's And not only that, we've got the steam coming out into the house. So it's potentially causing a mold issue if we don't have the windows open. And my mother-in-law and my wife always get cold when I open the windows, so we can't get the steam out of the home. And so, where do we want steam and thermal energy, and we're not necessarily going to be spending tons of time out there, is in a greenhouse. So why not put a commercial kitchen in here to take the products from here, process them in a way that, in a place that can take the steam and wants the surplus heat, and if it's a gas stove, which it probably should be, if you're going to use gas, well, now we've created a system that can use the CO2. Um, and then when we're done, we can move the product down into a root cellar at the bottom. Um, and so we can go a step further and we can say, well, in the summertime, the root cellar wants to stay cold. So we can use this thing called earth tubes, which basically take a small DC solar powered fan, pull air underground, cool it down from, let's say, plus 30, and inject it into the, the root cellar to keep our produce cool through the winter. This also makes sure nobody dies of asphyxiation in the root cellar if things are decomposing because now we've got a steady flow of air moving into the greenhouse. The surplus energy from, this green, from the root cellar is going to be cool, so we actually have a way of calculating cool energy. We call it cool. So in, this, in the summertime when the greenhouse is overheating, we're moving cold air 
which is which is potentially got some contaminants into it, into the greenhouse to cool the greenhouse down, feeding the plants with some of these contaminants that would asphyxiate, asphyxiate us, um, and acting as a cooling mechanism. We're also preheating the ground through the summertime with these air tubes, so that in the wintertime, now we're taking minus 40 air, minus 30 air, underground, pre-warming it, so we're not going to freeze our root cellar. Um, and then again, any uh, byproducts of decomposition in our root cellar is then going to move into the actual greenhouse itself. So every element serves functions to every other element and creates a stronger system as a result of it. Okay, so um, that's perfect. I've got time for questions. I went through a ton of stuff there. Um, we've got 10 minutes for questions, and I uh, can go back into any of the slides and talk about them. Um, there you go, yeah. You kind of lost me on why the greenhouses in Medicine Head are orientated all over the place. I didn't quite understand. The rationale there. So basically, uh, especially in Medicine Hat, natural gas is even freer than free. And, uh, and so they would rather pump heat into the greenhouse and glaze the entire surface and optimize it for light as opposed to optimizing it for thermal energy. Okay. Yeah. Quite get the heating bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So because glass is such a poor, such a poor R value, mm -hmm. they're literally just dumping energy in there to keep it warm so that they can maximize solar um, Lighting. Okay, I understand that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is there a minimum size you need? Like, can you use these concepts in something that's quite compact, or does there need to be a certain size for them to be effective? So today we're going to see a 100 square foot greenhouse, and it's 100 square feet because it doesn't need a building permit. <laughs> um, and that, I mean, that's the smallest that I would go. I have a 200 square foot greenhouse, which you're also going to see today, uh, and I think it's too small. Um, for me, the one that we're going to see at Hall Service is, a, is about an optimal size for a family. Um, but it's a, it's a much larger structure and it costs a little bit more. So that's about, I think, 500 square feet. And the one in Canmore at the Alpine Apple School Yards, is that? That's probably 350 square feet, I think. That's a pretty good size too, yeah. That was a straw bale greenhouse, actually. And I was really skeptical about using straw. But uh, what's really cool about straw and all natural building materials, if they're used properly, is that if you've got a vapor permeable membrane, basically, in this case, it's... Uh, plaster on both sides, then you have a uh, sufficient drying effect in the wall. So it can dry to the inside and to the outside depending on the conditions. So we acknowledge the straw will get damp or moist from time to time, but we haven't put any vapor barriers in there to lock the moisture in. And so the walls can actually breathe and dry out. Yeah. Do they dry out in that context or have you had any molding issues with that? No, I did a case study on it last summer, or maybe it was the summer before, I can't remember now, and no sign at all. I would actually consider building a, a greenhouse with straw bales. Yeah. yeah, I would consider that for sure. Yeah. Uh, you were saying that when building onto a house, you said that a mold cube that you don't recommend, but what can you do if you do build against the building to uh, keep it from molding and all that, like just to separate the So some buildings are um, vapor indifferent, I'll say. So it doesn't matter if vapor comes in, like if you build against a steel building or something like that, or you build against a uh, concrete block wall or an ICF wall, <clears throat> you'll be fine. Uh, but if you're building up against something that's stick framed, like two by fours, two by sixes, um, you'll be really careful. And so again, you think about a conventional building, we've got drywall, plastic vapor barrier, insulation studs and then you've got some sort of permeable membrane on the outside that allows it to dry outwards now you're going to put a greenhouse onto the outside of that and you're potentially going to increase the vapor on the outside and you're going to potentially have increased vapor on the inside you might not have enough drying impact in there and so um, probably ironically a straw bale wall in between the two of that two of them might be good the way that dale did it he actually went the other way uh, and, and this is a very uh, reductionist or engineering kind of approach to it, but he basically sealed the crap out of both sides of the wall to stop anything coming in. But um, we'll see how that pans out. I, I have my, you know, suspicions about it in terms of uh, vapor will always find a way. It's relentless. And so if you try and lock vapor out, Vapor has a very strong case of FOMO and it will get its way in there eventually 
and uh, do its best. So um, I think the better approach is to go with a vapor, a, a system that has no consequences of vapor, so it can't rot, or to have a system where there's got a lot of drying potential. Um, that's a really good question for a building scientist if you're going to do that. And even as a designer of these spaces myself, I would engage a building scientist to help design that wall system in between the two spaces. Okay, we have time for one more question, then we're going to have to run to the greenhouse tour, so I'm going to take one more. Well, it's not really a question, but those sort of that picture with the commercial greenhouse, or the commercial kitchen attached to the greenhouse, would the mold control because of that system that we're talking about? So that greenhouse that I've designed uh, is made out of materials that are indifferent to the